and freedom, and grace be with you. Uh, my name is John Clifton. Welcome to another edition of Hard Fire. And this is another one of those things that involve taxes, taxes, and more taxes. Uh, we've had discussions about fair tax, income tax, no tax, and um, along the way during those discussions there's been a mention here or there of a flat tax. And so tonight we're going to go into that part of the tax discussion with my two guests. I, but I guess I'll let them introduce themselves. They're friends of Hard Fire from previous appearances. I'll uh, begin with <coughs> the gentleman in the black suit. I'm Bob Cotton from the Hudson Valley Libertarians. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you, sir? I'm, <coughs> I'm, I'm Brian Jones. I'm a consulting actuary, also an attorney, and from right here in Brooklyn. Very good. And uh, I remember from very stimulating conversations about honest um, and sound money and about some other aspects of um, the taxation. Uh, there have been a couple of shows that, that have been done on the issue of um, introducing a consumption tax to replace the income tax. And many people will know my shows where I discuss misapplication of the income tax to most Americans. Uh, but uh, as another alternative system for how to proceed in terms of fundamental reform uh, of the tax system, uh, there hasn't been that much serious talk lately about a flat tax. I think the last time it was talked about was uh, by um, Steve Forbes in the, uh, during his presidential run, uh, and then prior to that during the second term of Ronald Reagan. Um, anyone can begin here, but um, what are we um, talking about in terms of um, instituting a flat tax? Well, I, th I, th I think the main reason that we need to talk seriously about a flat tax is that I think it's something that the left and the right can be induced, induced to agree on, at least in concept. There are many arguments once you get the concept in place, and uh, one, one of them is I, w I would recommend, and I think this is not too hard a sale, that the flat tax be applied to the bulk of the people and not necessarily to the very rich. Now, there's a good argument to be had, and I think I'd like to avoid it, at least initially, as to what the definition of the very rich is. But other than that, I think the great advantage of a flat tax is that it provides a marginal rate. Again, we can argue about what that rate should be, but it's going to be consistent all the way down the income scale. Mm -hmm. And I would certainly recommend, along the lines that Milton Friedman suggests, that we make the thing progressive to some extent by providing essentially a flat demographic grant. And this is something that the proponents of the so-called fair tax, the federal sales tax, uh, suggest very strongly. But in their case, it involves setting up a whole new mechanism. I think that can be avoided by integrating the flat demographic grant with a flat tax. And that has the additional great advantage that it takes us away from the welfare system. So if I understand this right, this is a tax that would be flat per demographic, but not a flat, flat tax as in like one level for everybody. It would, it would be one level for everybody, but it would be combined with a essentially the Milton, Milton Friedman exemption. negative income tax. <coughs> no, not so much an exemption, but a, but a, but a flat grant. So that, <coughs> and, and if that's the case, then that means, assuming just to pull a number out of the mm -hmm. air, the tax rate is 80%, mm -hmm. that means that everybody who works keeps, and uh, who works and goes out and earns a dollar, keeps 80 cents of it. Okay, well, I'll bring Mr. Cotton in on this, um, but, but it sounds to me like when the, the fundamental simplicity of the idea of a flat tax might be undermined by saying but, and then adding the stipulations you, you just did for, for demographics and grants. Um, I, what do you think about this? Uh, well, <clears throat> first I'd like to point out that the uh, Libertarian Party platform has not adopted the flat tax most recently. In the 2006 version, the term flat tax isn't mentioned. They're anti-tax in some cases. Uh, they like the elimination of property tax. They would like tax rates reduced. Um, for myself, I see 
I see objections both from the, liber, uh, from the liberal and the conservative side. I think the liberals claim that it would be unfair in that uh, some of our other taxes like the uh, FICA tax and uh, so on are regressive. If we then had a flat tax on top of it, the overall taxation would be regressive. They might also point out that uh, with the present system of subsidies, which frequently amount to welfare for the rich, that you would then end up with the middle class supporting the rich, which may be true at present, too, I think. But uh, it would be even more true under a flat tax. On the other hand, the conservatives could object that even a flat tax does not eliminate the redistribution of income to such an extent, and I could point this out in a, in a minute or two if you give me an opportunity, uh, to such an extent that there is an incentive for the majority to raise the tax rate to such a, to such a point that there is no incentive to work. I can, I can show you this with a little thought experiment. Just imagine for a moment that the federal government <clears throat> imposes a tax of R percent on everyone, and uh, <clears throat> absolutely flat, let's say, and then returns the proceeds to the people an equal amount per head. What does that mean? Everybody pays R times his income to the government. The government returns to each person R times the average income. Now, for a person below the average income, he's going to be better off. There'll be a net advantage. A person above the average income will be worse off. There'll be a, bit, a net disadvantage. However, in any reasonable scenario, the median is below the average. So there will always be a majority in favor of raising the rate all the way up to 100 percent. So I'm, I claim that there's a built-in bias under democracy, under majority rule in particular, uh, to redistribute income even with a flat tax. A flat tax does not fix that. So I, I see difficulties both from the liberal, liberal and the conservative um, side. Yeah, the, this, uh, history needs to be brought up in relation to this. You may be able to bring up uh, you know, some reference, reference material relating to history of taxation, but um, there was an attempt, a serious attempt to flatten the rates 20 years ago during the Reagan administration, mm -hmm. uh, second term. And it was based on the same, similar arguments that if you flattened it out, got rid of most or all of the exemptions, deductions, and whatnot, um, then it would be fairer for all, you know, uh, basically. Uh, but, you know, as years go by, you know, politicians, or politicians, they work, worked around the system. Uh, that was newly in place and said, no, let, let, let's raise the rate here and let's add back an, uh, an exemption and a deduction. Uh, and eventually you got some, back something like the same complexity that you had uh, prior to the flattening of the rates. It might have been marginally worse because uh, you know, they raised the rates but didn't bring back all the, ex the deductions and exemptions. Uh, so some people were worse off at, at, at the end of it. Uh, how would the current effort to institute a flat tax differ from that history? Well, I, th I think Bob is right, and uh, you're, you're right too, that there would necessarily be a tension, mm -hmm. because the, uh, the, uh, the tension would be between the flat demographic grant at the bottom and the R percent rate. No, uh, no question about that. But there is, there, there is always that kind of, ten kind of tension, uh, even, even now. Presumably, there are people who would say that welfare should go up 50 percent and income taxes should go up to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And that argument is, is there whether you have a flat structure, the kind of thing that I, that I was talking about, or the present graduated structure. I mean, my, uh, in, in previous uh, discussions of the sales tax, I've, to some extent, defended the income tax, but I've always tried to slip in a qualifier that I do not defend the complexity of it. The more simplicity we get, the better. The more we can get rid of deductions and adjustments and all the rest of it, uh, even to the extent of attacking some sacred cows like the home mortgage deduction, which would be very difficult, to the extent we can get the rate down and still provide through this demographic grant, through the uh, Milton Friedman idea, <coughs> a progressive structure to the, uh, to the tax as a whole, the better. And even, even Hayek uh, ag agrees with that. I, I don't quote Hayek a heck of a lot, but he certainly endorses the idea of providing a minimum level of uh, support 
to people who cannot provide it for themselves. Again, as we said earlier, there's a, a good political argument to be made as to how high that support should be because it inevitably sends the R rate of income tax up the more you support at the bottom end. So there is certainly a tension and a political argument and there are always going to be people on the left who are pushing one way and people on the right pushing another way. But I think the, the basic concept is something that the right and left can probably agree on. And I don't think you'd get very many opponents to the proposition that the income tax, and let's talk for the moment just about the individual income tax, is vastly too complex. Right? The uh, proponents of the original flat tax maybe 10, 15 years ago were talking about a one-page return. Mm -hmm. And I think you could, you could get pretty, pretty close to that. In fact, I think you could even get to a stage where most of the people, again, putting the very wealthy on one side, uh, had taxes withheld at the, uh, out, out of wages and, I would argue, out of in, uh, income such as dividends, interest, etc. That withholding could take place, and if the tax were truly flat and there were a mechanism to provide the demographic grant, you would hardly need to file a return unless something very unusual was happening. Well, it's just that that that, that caveat of hardly ever need it. The what insults true um, supporters of liberty is that there is any so-called need, you know, to man to be a mandatory snitch upon oneself and and <coughs> uh, submitting information returns uh, or, or um, having third parties uh, act as unpaid government informants, uh, disclosing to the government your financial um, circumstances every year or every quarter. Uh, the, the principle that uh, libertarians object to is, is, is this notion of compelled force or force to extract um, property from, from a person that is, that is justly theirs um, without permission and, um, and to go back to some of the um, historical discussion of the development of the income tax uh, without apportionment. Uh, it was supposed to be, uh, if any such any such tax scheme that was supposed to be developed and implemented was supposed to be apportioned if it was going to be a direct tax. Uh, it, it, and yet we ended up with this uh, system that is technically supposed to be an indirect tax based on all the Supreme Court decisions and the initial um, creation of it, but it operates administratively like an, a direct tax without apportionment. Uh, I find that to, and, and, and it, it involves this system of compelled filings of returns that uh, goes against the grain of liberty. I mean, the, the founding fathers didn't do the Boston Tea Party to more efficiently administer the tax system uh, for, the, for the British Empire. They were objecting to taxation. No, no, they weren't. They were objecting to taxation without representation. Or, or to put no. it another way, taxation without consent. I like to come back to yeah. the term consent right. from the Declaration. That the problem may not be that we have public goods, as perhaps uh, education of the young might be a public good, or vaccinating the populace might be a public good, where somebody is going to benefit who differs from who's paying. And that is a problem that some libertarians have difficulty facing. But there are those libertarians that put the emphasis, I think, on consent, uh, and contract that uh, it's okay to be taxed or even audited if you've previously consented to mm -hmm. be taxed and audited, yeah. uh, but only then. And consent means the ability to withdraw consent when things become oppressive or to seek some other alternative, maybe private, government. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But, uh, oh, well, before you go uh, further, sorry. let me um, interrupt <coughs> just to bring up uh, the fact that uh, our show is sponsored in a manner of speaking by uh, right-minded libertarians who uh, want to see discussions of this sort and others that bear upon liberty and upon uh, the ma maintenance of freedom in this state and in the country. I invite you to take a look at some of the literature and activities of uh, other Libertarian Party um, supporters and activists in this state, uh, beginning um, with the, the state party, um, New York um, Libertarian Party, which you can um, access at ny.lp.org. Uh, you can also um, look at into the activity of the Manhattan 
Libertarian Party at um, ManhattanLP.org to um, find out um, their doings within um, the Big Apple. Uh, there is a Active Queens um, uh, Party, a uh, Libertarian Party of Queens County uh, that meets in Astoria each month, and um, our website is LPQC.org. Uh, I invite you to take a look at the activities of the Libertarian Party and make sure that you get involved and keep abreast of it so that you too can invest in your own preservation of uh, liberty and bring back freedom to New York State. Um, okay, uh, Brian, you were going to continue? Yeah, I would just add a little afterword to that. I don't agree with much of what libertarians stand for, <laughs> but I do think they're pretty good about bringing people like me onto, onto this show. All right. So uh, I think that testimonial is well in order. Very well. Uh, coming back to your uh, orig original comments, mm -hmm. uh, the only person I ever heard of who liked paying taxes was Oliver Wendell Holmes, mm -hmm. who said that they were the price of freedom and he enjoyed buying freedom. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not quoting him verbatim, but I'm close. Mm -hmm. Everybody else that I know or know of does not enjoy the process of taxation. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, they want something from government, even, even if it's only protecting them from Hitler. Mm -hmm. there, there are certain functions that the government has to perform, and Bob just mentioned a couple more. Uh, I, I, I would say we need to be protected from monopolies. We need to be protected mm -hmm. from Microsoft. And once you decide that we're going to do that, you need to raise money in order to do it. And what, what I'm pushing is the idea that once you decide how much service, how, how many services, what, what you want in the way of services and what it's going to cost, what is the most efficient way to raise that? And I think a flat income tax combined with a demographic grant to keep people out of poverty is the right way to go. As Bob said, uh, there's, there's no question that we'll argue till the cows come home about what the level of taxation should be and what the level of that demographic grant should be. But I think that mechanism is the, is the way to go. I'd like to say a word about monopoly. It mm -hmm. seems to me that the prime example of monopoly in our culture is the government itself. It insists that it be the only government, that it uh, have the final say about everything, mm -hmm. And this causes several problems. Not only does it cause the redistribution of wealth problem that I mentioned, but it causes the problem mentioned by one of the Latin writers, uh, who watches the watchers? Now, if you had uh, multiple jurisdictions that were able to investigate each other, then maybe somebody might watch the watchers. But as long as we have the idea that there has to be a king or a democratically elected king, then uh, this will be a problem. So there are essential problems in the system that we have. You mentioned nobody likes taxes. I thought that would be a good time to put up this book that I mm -hmm. was once given and found very interesting. With It's uh, a history, really, a history of mankind through the point of view of taxes. And it uh, makes quite an, quite an issue of how much of history was caused by bad taxes and uh, things that you would never expect. Uh, and that's wonderful. Uh, we have the background there. People are, should be looking at the Charles Adams of Salem history uh, that, that's um, articulated in that book. I just want to go back to the one point about tax, opposing taxation versus opposing taxation without representation. Uh, it, 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 in many um, respects, that is almost the same thing because uh, they were objecting to the unlawful ac application of tax, taxes and, and the um, decree that uh, the, gov the government said it could just issue a tax on um, whatever it wanted to and compel compliance. Uh, that's what the founders objected to and, and ever since then we, they created a, uh, a system through the Constitution and then through the case law that came out of it that served this country well for uh, the next hundred and almost 150 years, 140 whatever, before they instituted the permanent income tax uh, in 1913 of not having one. There was no need to have a, a tax system or grants or any such thing. We got by with, with excises and tariffs, uh, which ha you could object to as well, but uh, not to the same extent as uh, a direct tax on individuals um, in, in a way that effectively works out. Um, so we're back to the system that, in principle, the founders objected to with the T situation, 
where uh, a government has, administratively at least, um, declared that it will have some kind of tax system and compel um, compliance and compel reporting. Uh, and unless you remove those fundamental impediments, you haven't fundamentally changed the tax system as far as I'm concerned because the coercion is still the foundation. Uh, we can talk about grants and demographics, but if you're, if you're typically manipulating uh, the way in which you compel people to do everything, report and pay, you haven't fundamentally changed a thing. Well, I think when you're a member of the society and you are expecting certain services, mm -hmm. There is no doubt that those services have to be paid for. There's a very good left-right argument to be had as to how, much, how, how many of those services should be provided by the government. And the closer you are to the libertarian position, the smaller that minim minimum uh, provision of services becomes. But you cannot eliminate the services that are needed at the central level. Specifically, you cannot fight Hitler without that costing a lot of money. And when you fight Hitler, you have to provide the money that's necessary. In other words, that's a choice. So the question is In other words, we, because we've chosen to be a gigantic empire abroad and, and, and call everybody who opposes us the Hitler of the moment, and because we have this gigantic welfare state, because we believe that everybody has to be covered at all times under all circumstances, uh, that's why we're required to have a huge tax structure to support uh, this entire I, war apparatus and I, um, social I, safety I, I net did, apparatus. I, did, I didn't say we should have. Well, a, well that's you know no, that's no, where no, it leads. No. You know, <laughs> no, that's that that that's where it leads. But the but the whole uh, the whole idea of representative government, uh, who's watching the watches, etc., mm -hmm. is that we want to nip the kind of tendencies that you're talking mm -hmm. about in the bud. And I did not say everybody who looks remotely like Hitler or can be called Hitler should be suppressed and we should provide the money to do that. Mm -hmm. I said specifically that when we have a threat like Hitler, something has to be done about it, and that costs money. But I think he's pointed and that out, has to be done at the, mm -hmm. at the central government level. I think he's pointed out uh, one problem, that once we have the... Uh, mechanism in place for the federal government to fight Hitler, it insists on fighting Hitler all the time, and it invents Hitler if he doesn't exist. The other possibility that we also see some signs of nowadays is the possibility that our own government might become Hitler. It's getting a little bit out of control, a little bit scary, and uh, there are at least quite a few people scared about it, whether it's justified or not, and it's, uh, I think the, the problem is from two sides and a flat tax doesn't begin to touch any of that. No, but the flat tax goes in the right direction. I'm not saying that the flat tax is going to straighten out all the problems we have with our government. And I would probably agree with you about man, many, many of those problems, though perhaps we're getting a little far afield. Uh, but I, I, I do think that a flat tax is something that would improve the society from the position it's in now and would move it forward. Well, let, yeah. me ask, uh, let me ask you about from the point of view of this analogy, um, because sometimes this, this, the flat tax is presented as a means of not only simplifying the code but making it fairer because of the, the less of a burden on everybody um, or, or on a, the perception of, of, of a less of a burden. From the point of view of the simple proposition that taxation is theft, uh, is there a fair way to get mugged? I mean, I mean <laughs> you say a rich guy down the street gets mugged, and they take a couple thousand dollars off him, and a poor person is the next victim of the mugger down the street, uh, and he gets a few dollars taken off him. Um, I mean, was it what was the treatment the poor guy got fairer because he only got he lost a couple bucks? Well, the concept of a democratic government does not involve the government mugging us. Now, I'm sure you can bring up examples where the government is mugging us and there are things I'm that, thinking it's exactly that should be the done same about thing it. in principle. You know, they've got guns. They say, you know, if your name is Ed Brown, we're going to raid your house, even though we don't have a law on the basis of which we're going to raid your house or convict you of anything. Uh, but let me go back uh, to... Uh, you know, just <laughs> I'm, t I'm tempted to follow that one, but maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe I'd better not. Uh, <clears throat> I'm... I'm, I'm resting my case on the simple proposition that there are certain services that we expect at a government level. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. I don't think you would, you would deny that. Vaccination is, 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 is a very good one. I do not want um, many people out there having infectious diseases that will affect me, my family, and everybody else, and not doing anything about it. Um, just briefly, this country was founded on just being large enough and funding a government large enough to defend life, liberty, and property as reflected in the Bill of Rights and, and other basic rights. Um, vaccinations and other things um, start falling into the gray zone because it, 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 you think another way you can invent a reason to inflate uh, the need for government to, to tax people well, uh, to not, fund it. We're uh, not inventing a reason to, to tax when we say one, one of the present topics is health care. Mm -hmm. Health care is going to cost a lot of money. It needs to be paid for. Question, should the government do it? Mm -hmm. Now, it's certainly true that at the time of the Declaration of Independence, mm -hmm. we had an extremely fair health system. Mm -hmm. The system was that if you were rich or poor or in between, if you got sick, typically you died yeah. and there wasn't a damn thing we could do about it. Okay. Now, that is not the situation now. Right. And but I, I, before we run out of time, I want uh, Bob to react I'm to sorry. any of this here because we're um, about, about a minute or so go, to go here. Um, what do you think about the matter of fairness and, 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 and the tax system? Uh, well, I'd like to go back to the republic as it existed earlier. I think that before the federal government mm -hmm. was very strong and it was restricted to foreign policy, there was a considerable amount of choice possible just by voting, picking up, voting with your feet, moving to another state. It could make a real difference. Indeed, it still makes some difference now. A lot of people and many mm -hmm. businesses move based on their judgment about the legal situation in different states. But as the federal government imposes more and more uniformity on us, it becomes less and less possible to have any choice. And choice and consent are the things I would like to focus on, as I think some libertarians do. We're going to have to leave it right there because that's um, all our time. I hope this hasn't left everybody too flat. You know, and <laughs> I thank you for your present your or presentations, over and I hope you join us again for another exciting episode of Hard Time. Hardfire is funded in part by the Libertarian Party of New York. Catering for the cast and crew of Hardfire is generously provided by Da Vincenzo Restaurant, 256 Prospect Park West, Brooklyn, New York, 11215, 718-369-3590, www.davincenzorestaurant.com.